live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There have been some incredible revenge games throughout the history of the National Football League. I'd be here all day if I listed every single one of them. After a great career in Cleveland, linebacker Chip Banks goes to Indianapolis and in 1992 hosts four sacks against the Browns in the season opener. Brett Favre in his first game against the Packers after spending 16 seasons in Green Bay throws three touchdown passes in a 2009 victory as a member of the Vikings. Steve Smith as a member of the Ravens, scoring two touchdowns in 2014 against the Carolina Panthers after playing 13 seasons there. The list goes on and on. But here's one revenge game that you might not have heard of that might be not just one of the best in the history of the Los Angeles Rams, but maybe the history of the NFL considering the circumstances. At the start of the 1979 season, quarterback Bob Lee was unceremoniously cut by the Vikings in a bitter feud between he and Bud Grant. His playing days looked all but done. About four months later, he comes off of the bench and defeats his former team in an absolutely monumental game. And this is the story behind Bob Lee and the greatest revenge game in Rams history. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand just who Bob Lee is, and why the Vikings cut him in the first place. Oddly enough, this is not the first video I made about the former Vikings quarterback, as the story of how he even got into the NFL in the first place is incredibly bizarre. Lee got an invite to an All-Star game simply because he knew someone, but he never actually got to play in the game. However, one Viking scout saw him throwing the ball on the sidelines, and liked the way he threw the ball. Knowing nothing else about him, with the 441st pick in the 1968 NFL Draft in round number 17, the Vikings took Lee. If you want to learn more about that crazy situation, then click the card in the upper right corner. However, considering the fact that most 17th round picks don't even sniff the roster, for Lee to carve out the career that he did was incredible. He was one of the better and more reliable backup quarterbacks in football. During his first stint with the Vikings, he was forced to start six games when Gary Quazzo couldn't go. In those six games, he went 5-1 and his touchdown to interception ratio and passer rating in that stretch were actually slightly better than the league-wide average. The Atlanta Falcons took a notice of this, and with Norm Van Brocklin wanting a quarterback, in 1973, they traded their first-round pick in the 1974 NFL Draft to acquire the Vikings' backup. His time in Atlanta was a mixed bag. In 1973, Lee started 10 games and went 8-2 while leading the league in yards per completion, and nearly guided the Falcons to their first playoff appearance in franchise history. In 1974, Lee did not do that, and threw three touchdowns and 14 picks. His passer rating that season was an abysmal 32.4, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. And following the 1974 season, after Marion Campbell became the full-time head coach of the Falcons, he decided to release Lee, making him a free agent. Lee didn't fit their plans anymore, especially now that the team drafted Steve Barkowski first overall in the 1975 NFL Draft. And because of this, Lee found his way back on the Vikings. This time, instead of backing up Gary Quazzo, he was backing up Hall of Famer Fran Tarkenton. Much like his first stint, Lee was a pretty good backup quarterback. He went 4-1 and in 5 starts, threw a touchdown at Super Bowl XI, won a playoff game against the Rams in the 1977 Divisional Round, and on the final day of the 1977 season, in a must-win game against the Detroit Lions to get into the postseason and win the NFC Central, he threw two touchdowns and posted a passer rating of 151 in a 30-21 victory. For the most part, Lee and the Vikings were on very good terms. That all changed in 1979. Prior to the start of the 1979 season, Bob Lee wanted a brand new contract with the Vikings. Part of that was because of his over a decade of service in the NFL, as well as his relatively steady play for a long period of time as Minnesota's backup, especially in big games. Part of that was that Fran Tarkenton retired after the 1978 season, and Lee felt that he deserved more, since he thought maybe he would get some more playing time. Minnesota not only refused to give him a new contract, but they openly began shopping him. That summer, general manager Mike Lynn tried to trade Lee for Raiders quarterback Ken Stabler, since Stabler was unhappy with his situation in Oakland. While Al Davis laughed at the idea, a few days later, the Vikings signed another quarterback, acquiring John Reeves, the former Eagles first-round pick, off of waivers. If you want to learn more about Reeves' strange career, then click the card in the upper right corner. Lynn said that acquiring Reeves didn't change anything with regards to Lee's future with the team, but considering that acquisition, plus 1977 first-round pick Tommy Kramer waiting in the wings, plus their fourth-round pick for the most recent draft in Steve Dills, it was clear that Lee was not going to have much of a chance on this team. The contract situation never sorted itself out. Lee never reported to training camp because he was so disgruntled at how the Vikings were handling all this, and a few weeks later, the Vikings cut him. Lee was furious if the Vikings knew that they were going to cut him, that they didn't do it earlier so that he would have enough time to learn a brand new system and actually have a chance to fit in with another club. 
he felt all along that even with Tarkenton's departure, he was never going to be given a chance to compete for the job, even though he knew the system like the back of his hand and had spent nearly a decade in Minnesota. And instead of Grant cutting him gracefully and thanking him, according to Lee, Grant essentially slapped him in the face. As Lee said, Grant did not say thanks for anything. He told me if I came back now that I would screw up the quarterback situation and that Mike Lynn is one of the great general managers in the game. This was how his Vikings career came to an end. Not only was Lee no longer needed in Minnesota, but his presence would have messed up the depth chart. That's how little the Vikings thought of him, and that's how little the Vikings valued him. Lee was furious at how this all came to an end. Eventually, after sitting out the first two months of the season, Lee wound up signing with the Los Angeles Rams, who needed some quarterback help badly after Pat Hayden broke the little finger of his throwing hand, and after Vince Ferragamo missed some time with a broken hand. Lee knew his role in the team. He was there for insurance, and was just there because the Rams needed anybody who could throw a football at this point. Little did he know that one month after signing, he was about to get revenge on his old team in the best way possible. December 2nd, 1979. It's week 14 of the NFL season, and we have a big matchup on our hands between the Minnesota Vikings and the Los Angeles Rams. Both of these teams are fighting for their playoff lives. Minnesota enters this game at 6-7, two games behind Washington for the final wildcard spot in the NFC. A win here keeps Minnesota in the hunt and gives them a fighting shot heading into the home stretch and making it back to the postseason for the seventh straight season and the 11th time in the last 12 years. A loss here, however, and their season is all but over, as they would fail to have a winning record for the first time since 1972. As for the Rams, they enter this one tied with the New Orleans Saints at 7-6 atop the NFC West. They need this one to keep their lead and have a shot at winning the division for the seventh straight season. When the game starts off, it's Vince Ferragamo who is starting under center for the Rams. While the game starts off well for the Rams, as on Minnesota's opening drive, the Rams get a block punt and return of 51 yards for the touchdown, the team would struggle heavily for the rest of the first half, especially on the offensive side of the football. On their first drive of the game, they go 3-and-out out after Ferragamo, instead of stepping up the pocket, decides to hold onto the ball for too long and takes the sack. Once again on the second drive, the Rams go 3-and-out, as Minnesota's defensive line continues to have its way with Ferragamo and that offense. On the third drive, facing third down, Ferragamo drops back to pass, and is instantly drilled by Tom Hannon, which causes him to lose the ball and get possession to Minnesota deep in LA territory. Even though the Rams score a touchdown on the fourth drive, it had nothing whatsoever to do with Ferragamo. The Rams went three and out, but then a muff pump by the Vikings gave the Rams new life inside the red zone. From there, Los Angeles ran the ball into the end zone, with Ferragamo only attempting one pass on the new drive, which fell incomplete. Drive number five, and the Rams have to punt again, as Ferragamo is lucky he didn't get picked off. And after drive number six ends in a punt, the seventh drive ends after a late heave down the field results in Paul Krause intercepting it. Fun fact, this pick was the 80th of Krause's career, and this pick set the all-time record for career interceptions, a record that still stands today. It was clear that Ferragamo wasn't getting the job done, as even though the game was tied, it could have been a whole lot worse. In the first half, Ferragamo was 4 for 10 with 22 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception, three net passing yards, and an abysmal passer rating of 8.3. So in the second half, it was time to see what the backup quarterback, Bob Lee, could do. And more than 40 years later, what he wound up doing still lives on in NFL history. With the score tied at 14 apiece in the third quarter, Lee is on a mission to not only win this game and keep the Rams' playoff hopes alive, but to show his former team what they were missing out on. And with this 41-yard touchdown pass to Preston Denard, Lee did just that. It was a nice job by Lee buying time and waiting for Denard to get open on the deep ball. The Rams now held a 21-14 lead. Just to put into perspective how good this throw was and how bad Ferragamo was in the first half, on that throw alone, Lee had more than 13 times the net passing yards that Ferragamo did. Despite the touchdown pass, Minnesota got right back in it when in the fourth quarter, Tommy Kramer hit a moderate shot on a 22-yard strike to tie the game at 21-all. Even though Lee was playing relatively well and had a couple of nice throws, neither the Rams nor the Vikings would score for the remainder of regulation. And with that, we had overtime. After both teams trade punts on their first possession of the OT period, it was time for Lee to get to work. With the ball near midfield, Lee quickly goes through his reads and identifies Colin Bryant open in the flat. Bryant, with open field in front of him, does the rest and gets the Rams into Minnesota territory. Tack on a roughing the passer penalty, and the Rams are in field goal range. And after a few runs, on third down, they call a beautiful fake field goal, with Nolan Cromwell running it in from five yards out for the game-winning score. The Rams win it 27-21 and take sole possession of first place in the NFC West. After the game, all the talk was about Bob Lee's performance off the bench in place of the ineffective Vince Ferragamo, and how well he played against his former club. Lee threw for 161 yards, averaging an incredible 23 yards per completion, and finished the game with a passer rating of 85.7, more than 10 times what Ferragamo's rating was in the first half. 
For some perspective, the average passer rating in the NFL that season was slightly above 70. So for Lee to come into the game almost completely rusty and drop an 85 on his former team in a must-win game was something else. And as we would later find out, this game would turn out to be a heck of a swan song. Following Lee's performance, it seemed in the immediate aftermath that he was going to be the starting quarterback going forward. After the game, Vince Ferragamo flat out said that he was done. The Rams weren't going to commit to a quarterback until the middle of the week, but Ferragamo seemed like he was going to make the decision easy with his comments afterwards. He said, I doubt very strongly that I'll play next week. I just don't have the feel right now. I can't seem to control the team. I don't know what it is. They better keep me out. Maybe I should get a different perspective on things from the sidelines. He also predicted that he wouldn't play again this season. Those are some harsh words, and all signs indicated that this was Lee's team the rest of the way. However, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, this was not the case. Ferragamo was back under center the following week, and would not only start the rest of the way, but would wind up leading the Rams to their first Super Bowl appearance in franchise history, when they shocked just about everyone by getting to the big game following a 9-7 campaign where they only had a point differential of plus 14. Lee would never throw another pass with the Rams again, and would serve as the backup quarterback on the team in 1980, before never playing in the NFL again after that. This meant that this game against the Vikings was, for all intents and purposes, his final game ever. And man, what a heck of a final game that was. To come off of the bench against your former team in a must-win game, and pick apart a part of defense that you knew very well and that gave the first-string quarterback fits, must feel pretty good. And it must feel even better when your former team didn't want you in the first place out of fear that you would mess up their depth chart, even though you gave years and years of your time to that organization. For a 17th round pick who was drafted simply because some scouts saw him throwing a football on the sideline, Bob Lee had a heck of a career. And in the countless number of games that he played in, considering the circumstances, he may have saved his absolute best for last. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters helping with the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.